But at this point, what I would like to do is uh, break up the discussion a little bit um, and start to think a little bit about um, talking with a true uh, expert. And um, if there's one thing that I can absolutely say about Dr. Brandon Blue is that he is passionate uh, about what he does. It comes through in um, every conversation I've ever had with him. Um, and so we thought it would be uh, valuable to talk to um, a myeloma expert who he himself is African-American, who has done so much for the myeloma community, uh, not just in Moffitt. I know we're going to hear a little bit about your background in a second, Brandon, so I don't want to steal your thunder, man. Uh, but um, uh, let's take a little bit of time to talk to Brandon and understand a little bit more from his perspective. So, Brandon, thank you uh, so much for joining me, my friend. No, thank you uh, for having me. I'm happy to talk to uh, the folks of Atlanta and uh, surrounding communities. Excellent. Oh, it's great to have you here, my friend. Well, listen, they're here to hear you and not hear me. So, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about why you went into this field of multiple myeloma. Yeah. So first of all, I'll say I do have a, a Atlanta connection. Uh, my father-in-law was the uh, sheriff of DeKalb County for many years, uh, Sheriff Thomas Brown. So if anybody in the Atlanta area might know him, that is my father-in-law. But uh, so that's family. Um, so so really for me, um, I am the first doctor in my family, uh, which means I had a dream and a goal, but like not really a road of like how to get there. Um, so my story is kind of a little crazy because by chance, by God, by fate, um, my family, when we grew up, we grew up right across the street from a nursing home. And so that nursing home one day when I was 15, 16 years old, had a big, like, we're hiring sign out front. And so, um, you know, I kind of ran over and told my mom, like, Hey, like, uh, I'm ready to, you know, work. And so she was like, go across the street. You know, it's, it was very easy. Ended up getting a job at a nursing home and really um, started to really kind of pique my interest in like helping others and caring for people who really were in need. Um, I took that from high school to college and trying to figure out like, all right, well, how do I make a living with this? Like, how do I um, like really use that um, like joy that I had by doing that, um, but do it for the rest of my life. And so that's where really I became interested in medicine, but really like oncology, like if you say, all right, I want to be a doctor, there's, do you want to be a baby doctor? Do you want to be an adult doctor? Do you want to cut people? Um, and those kind of things, I had no idea. Um, but I did know that that was where I wanted to be. So um, luckily, I did well enough on grades and exams and those kind of things that it led me to go to medical school. I actually went to Meharry Medical College uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, which is one of the HBCU universities that we have here in the country. And so it was at Meharry where I really learned like, hey, I really want to help adults. I didn't want to like, you know, take care of crying babies. Um, I knew <laughs> that a knife in my hand was probably not the best thing, um, you know? And so I knew that I wanted to talk to people and really kind of help them change their lives by thinking and coming up with a plan to be a significant part of their lives. So it led me to go to Washington University, which is in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, one of the top uh, kind of medical institutions in our country. Um, and there is really where I saw oncology care at its peak. So uh, one of my mentors, Dr. John DePerzio, um, was really critical at kind of focusing me and kind of say, hey, this is critical to say, hey, oncology is the wave of the future. There's some cancers and some um, uh, treatments that you'll see that have been the same for you know, the past 30 years. But as Dr. McHale really said that really myeloma, you see the last, you know, five, 10 years, things have really exploded. So that's very exciting to have new options to be able to help people. So I said, hey, I, I have to jump on this train. I have to kind of be here to a point where, um, you know, I can help people. So then I said, well, one of the critical factors, as he brought up, was transplant. And uh, I didn't really have a good sense of that. And so when I left St. Louis, I said, you know what, let me come back to Tampa. I did actually an extra year of training in what they call transplant as well as cellular therapy. We didn't really talk too much about that yet, but really we have a way of using our own immune system to fight off cancer called CAR T cells. And that's really up and coming and actually recently got approved for multi myeloma. So I said, this is a win-win. And so for me, I said, hey, 
I need to come back. I need to share this new innovations, this new information that I have with the people I grew up with. So now I'm here in Tampa. I literally grew up 30 minutes down the road in St. Petersburg. And now I'm helping people that I went to middle school with, helping old principals, um, really people like from my community and uh, really helping give back. So, so that's why I'm here today. Uh, Atlanta's like a second home for me. Uh, that's where my wife and her family are from. Uh, but literally, um, we're here to help. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you, Brandon. What a what a story coming from a family uh, where there really was no medical background. I mean, let me just commend you on your uh, courage and your hard work to get through that. We know that uh, medical school and training, you, you've got, uh, I joke sometimes, you got more degrees than a thermometer, man, you know, between, <laughs> between all of your training and hematology, oncology, and then transplant. Um, and, and it really has meant uh, so much to us. I know one of the things that you get particularly passionate about, I mean, I, I love how you describe that you want to give back to your community. So, so let's just dive into that a little bit more. You know, the whole notion of our Empower Project is to get into the community to really demystify myeloma, to explain it so that people don't, don't want to ignore it, so, so people can know what it is. So people can realize that, you know, you don't get it because you're not spiritual or because you don't have uh, this or, or, or that, that it, that can, it can happen um, at a higher rate within the African community, African American community um, uh, and, and how important it is to make that diagnosis early on. Uh, you, you know, what is your perspective on that? What can we do to try and, you know, engage the community more? Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the things that you brought up that was critically important um, were the triplets, the transplants, and the clinical trials. You know, for myself, I think one of the things that's important as far as helping change health disparities is the three Ds, diagnosis, uh, don't complicate things and doctors. Okay. So number one being diagnosis. So like, as you said before, this isn't an easy thing. It's not like somebody's going to walk up to you and say, Hey, I have myeloma. So then that means that as the doctors, people, we have to kind of tell it to people, meaning that we have to give people the news as the people coming to us saying, hey, there's a lump in my breast that shouldn't be there. That makes sense. You say, oh, that's breast cancer. Or, hey, there's blood in my stool. You say, oh, that makes sense. This might be colon cancer. But for myeloma and these plasma cells, we have no way of the patient telling us. So that means us as the doctors, we have to be more keen on the diagnosis. Okay. So then we, we, we didn't share this slide, but this is something for the people to know that it's very important to know that not all patients present the same way. While some may have this anemia that uh, we talked about before, or some may have the back pain, in patients, especially African-Americans, it could just be their kidney function, okay, which is a very important um, kind of signal that, hey, something may be going wrong in the body. So I think that as the doctors, I think we need to... Um, kind of put this on the front of our brain to say, hey, uh, in certain populations and in certain communities, I think instead of this being number four or five on the list, maybe make it within the first one or two. And I, I think if we did a better idea of treating certain populations where this is the most problematic, then I think what we can do is pick it up earlier because you don't want to pick up myeloma after someone's had the bone fracture, you know, after someone uh, is in the hospital for this, you want to try to pick it up in the outpatient setting or in clinic so that this person can have a better quality of life. Number two, like I said, is the doctors. So I can't replicate myself, of course, everywhere. But what I do think that we need to do is we need to focus on having more people who are in tune with the minority community. You know, I think that, um, you know, this is, these are my people, this is my family, this is, you know, why I'm so in tune with this community, but we need to make sure that we really focus and have doctors who also have similar interests. And if those doctors have similar interests and they say, all right, well, what diseases are really affecting these folks? It's like, all right, most myeloma, we see, it's very clear, like it's not even a, a question anymore, you know, like it's very clear that, hey, certain groups, this is a problem. So how can we treat that group differently or the same as another group. We say, hey, we need to focus on this group then and say, hey, if, if one group is getting diagnosed in their 70s, one group in the mid 60s, what's going on there? What's the problem? You know, and really focus on that and really kind of put that underneath the microscope and kind of figure that out. So I, I do think that as doctors, I think that's one thing that we can do to really advocate for our patients, uh, especially those who are in high risk. And then number three, I think don't complicate things. I think when people get 
diagnosed with any cancer, myeloma included, people are scared, people are nervous, there's anxiety that comes on. And so sometimes we really try to come up with these very intricate like programs and things to like do with patients. I think honestly, at the end of the day, what people really wanna know is they can trust you, that people, that you have their best interests at heart and that really you're here to help them. You know, and, and, I, and I think unfortunately the way some of our modern medical system is, a lot mm. of times we're rushed. A lot of times like, you know, there's insurance and like numbers involved, you know, and, and, and things that really don't matter to the person sitting in the chair in front of you. So I think if we just don't complicate things, kind of go back to kind of the grassroots of medicine of us and a patient being right in front of us, not like, you know, sometimes we try to do the note at the same time and we're kind of type, you know, there's so many distractions, unfortunately, but just don't complicate things and really make it straightforward. And I think really that person, especially minorities, you know, a lot of times we're real loyal people, you know, and, and if we feel like we can trust you and that you on our side, then trust me, um, it'll lead to better outcomes, lead for more enrollment in clinical trials, and really uh, a overall just better experience for the medical field. So the three Ds, um, you know, diagnosis, doctors, and don't complicate things. I, I, I love the three Ds. I, I'm, I'm going to share those three Ds everywhere I go, man. That's really, <laughs> really well said. And, and it particularly resonated with me what you said at the end, you know, the, um, we can get, we can depersonalize medicine. You know, I remember when we were designing the, the, the rooms for our clinic and, and, and the engineer had come along and set it up that basically the computer screen was between the patient and the doctor. I'm like, no way. Like we want that thing. So I made them put them on, on these sort of uh, 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 levers that we could push back so that I can just talk to the patient because it's so important. You know, we use this phrase cultural competency and it sounds like a big word, but you just gave the best description I've ever heard of, of cultural competency that we, we don't complicate things, that we get down face to face with the patient. And of course, there's been a big problem during COVID, hasn't it? With people not being able to even go to the doctor that they're talking to them, like I'm talking to you right now. I mean, trust me, I love talking to you, Brandon, but I'd much rather be sitting in front of you right now. Yeah, for sure. This, this, this uh, face to face and, 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 and pushing aside, as you said, all the insurance problems and numbers and, and, and rushed pace. I think that is just such a beautiful lesson for uh, the patients listening today, but also the healthcare professionals that are listening today, how important it is to get back to simple medicine. You know, Brandon, I often share the, the, the lesson that my father taught me the day I got accepted to med school. He gave me two, two pieces of advice. He said, one, he said, Joe, because he was a doctor and he was, he was trained in Africa and came over here. And he said, number one, he said, treat nurses like the professionals they are. And he said, number two, God made you with two ears and one mouth for a reason. He said, you need to listen more than you speak. And I think if we listen more, it, it will be helpful. Uh, Brandon, we've only got a couple minutes left, but I got one last question for you. So I apologize. How, I am a little long-winded. I apologize. No, no, it's good, man. No, listen, I could talk to you all day, man. Like, <laughs> you are not long-winded. This is, this is fantastic. One of your passions is training more doctors in this area from this community. So just tell us in a couple of minutes about that, about your passion for that and how you think we can you know, you came from historical uh, black college and university. I know in the Atlanta area, you know, you think of Morehouse, there are other, you know, colleges and universities in the area that we want to see more docs come out of these places and come, go into the field of myeloma, of course. I want to work with them, but, but tell us about that. Yeah. So, you know, um, I think as a tendency and as a group, as a people, we really see that there's a problem in healthcare. Right. But what is advertised as the things that are on TV or the things like, um, you know, everybody wearing pink for breast cancer, you know, or people probably have even had family members with prostate cancer. You know, even as a medical student, I really hadn't heard of multiple myeloma. So I think that that's a very important thing to say, hey, if we want to kind of train the next wave of doctors, especially the minority doctors to say, hey, this is a problem as far as cancer related, then we need to tell people early, right? And so what I did, I actually gave a talk just last week uh, to some of the medical students. And I just said, hey, um, you know, do you necessarily have to be a myeloma expert? No, but you need to kind of make sure that whatever kind of 
you know, myeloma is one of those things that if you're a kidney doctor, for example, you can pick up on multiple myeloma. You know, if you um, are a surgeon and you see that um, there's elevated proteins in somebody's blood, then you can pick up on that. So whatever aspect of medicine that you do, you need to kind of make sure that you think about this very critical and unfortunately underserved um, a disease. And so um, I think that's really, really the key. And that's one of the things that I harp on when I give talks and when I uh, kind of talk to the uh, undergraduate and the medical students is to say, hey, um, you don't have to be like me. Of course, I would prefer that everybody be included in transplant and CAR T and, and multi-myeloma. Like that would be an excellent thing. But even if you don't, you can pick up myeloma in so many different ways. You can be an orthopedic surgeon and say, hey, look at this person's bones. They don't look right. You know, instead of, uh, you know, being ready to cut and focus on, you know, something else, you might say, hey, I remember th this conversation. I remember this lecture about multi-myeloma. I bet this person might fit that. Oh, he's African-American. Oh, that may, may mean even more so, you know? Uh, and so I just think that um, as a general community and as a, as a general, like, medical uh, education, I think we could do a better job. And I think that's one of the things that giving these talks, um, just to kind of have it on people's radar, um, because if you don't think about something, then you can't diagnose it, right? Like if it's not on your one, two, three, then you're kind of say, well, it must be something else. I'm, I'm not sure. But if you kind of keep it there on what we used to call the back burner, right? If you keep it on that back burner, then that means it's ready whenever you're ready for it, okay? And I think myeloma should be there um, uh, for all the patients, so... Fantastic. Especially in high risk communities. Brandon. Thank you so much. Brandon Blue's back burner. That, that, that's what I learned today. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. Fantastic, my friend. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your passion. I hope that we are going to inspire a whole series of uh, uh, baby Brandon Blues to come up and, 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 and uh, join the field. So thank you, my friend. I really appreciate you taking the time.